Welcome to the 15th annual Henry Kendall Lecture. It will be presented today by Professor Joachim Moratsky. Uh, I'm Ron Pren, uh, Director of the MIT Center for Global Change Science, which co-sponsors the lecture together with the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences. Also, the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering aids us in the selection uh, of the lecturers. The Henry Kendall Memorial Lecture Series honors the memory of Professor Kendall, born 1926, passed away in 1999. He was a 1990 Nobel Laureate in Physics, a long time very distinguished uh, member of MIT's physics, physics faculty, and apropos to this event, a ardent uh, environmentalist. The Kendall Lecture allows uh, MIT faculty and students and the general public to be introduced to forefront areas in global change science by outstanding researchers. I first met um, Henry myself when the Center for Global Change Science was set up in 1990 and I was pushing furniture around on the 13th floor where we were moved to. And he walked in and I looked up, he was wearing jeans as he often did and I looked up and I said, my goodness, this is a Nobel laureate has walked into my office. Uh, and uh, it, uh, he is, you know, was very interested in the center as things went on and, and very, very committed uh, to many environmental issues. Uh, Henry was a founding member and past chair of the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, he played a leading role in organizing a number of very influential scientific community statements on global problems, including the World Scientist Warning to Humanity in 1992, a general uh, warning about uh, the environmental crises uh, already there and to come, and equally important, the call for action that he made at the Kyoto Climate Summit in uh, 1997. Today's lecturer, Joachim Moratsky, is a director of the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology in Hamburg, Germany, and honorary professor at the University of Hamburg. Prior to these appointments, he was a professor at the UK National Oceanography Centre at the University of Southampton, and prior to that, a professor in the Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences Department here at MIT. He earned the PhD in physical oceanography in 1990 and before that the diploma in physics in 1985, both at the University of Kiel in Germany. Professor Moratsky studies the role of the oceans in climate and, clim and climatic change and how the in ocean influences the overall Earth system. For this, he uses both models and observations and applies a whole spectrum of ocean and climate models, from the simplified to the highly complex, depending on the question he is addressing. A major specific focus of his research has been the so-called meridional overturning circulation in the, in the Atlantic Ocean, which plays a prominent role in determining climate change in the past and present and potentially in the future. This circulation displays complex variability and the potential for abrupt change, uh, therefore leading to, to uh, resultant changes in the uh, surface climate system. His many research accomplishments are described in some 125 uh, peer-reviewed publications and 30 additional publications, including those in uh, books and uh, popular articles. Dr. Moratsky has also contributed to many major international organizations in climate science. He played a prominent role in the 2013 fifth assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, serving as, a, as an author of the synthesis report of that uh, panel, as coordinating lead author in working group one for evaluation of climate models, and as a lead author of the technical summary. He served as a member, then vice chair of the Joint Scientific Committee of the World Climate Research Program from 2005 to 2012. He is the recipient of a significant number of prominent awards recognizing his achievements, uh, 
including a lecture to the German National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, and is a recipient of the Nansen Medal of the European Geosciences Union in 2009. Uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome Joachim back to MIT today. The title of his talk, as you can read there, Recent Global Temperature Trends, What Do They Tell Us About Anthropogenic Climate Change? Joachim. Thank you, Ron. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I never had the pleasure of meeting Professor Kendall, even though we overlapped here for almost nine years. Um, very sorry about that. But I'm deeply honored that I've been invited to present this lecture to commemorate his uh, memory and the legacy uh, he left us. I want to touch on three topics, related topics here in my lecture. Uh, first, just uh, as a reminder to many here, uh, some basics of observed climate change in the past, and then get into the, what I believe are the fundamentals of uh, anthropogenic uh, induced climate change, something dear to everyone who's physically thinking, energy conservation. And um, after that, I will um, talk a bit more directly about climate variability and, and the, uh, the surface warming haters. And I will also explain uh, what exactly I mean by that. So let us first look at some basic elements of the observed climate. And arguably, the most basic one is surface temperature, the global average of surface temperature for which we have a record uh, going back to about 1850. Uh, if, if you think that the, the things are a bit out of focus here, uh, no, your glasses are fine, the projector is fine. What we are seeing is several reconstructions taking the, the station-based temperature observations around the world and building a global average out of that, which is in itself not a trivial task, and what we see that since 1900 onward, the various curves coincide pretty much, which means uh, um, the, the, the so taking the difference between the reconstruction as a measure of uncertainty, we are pretty sure of some of the most basic things because the different reconstructions tell the same story. And the most basic one is we've had a very substantial warming since the beginning uh, of the 20th century, a warming of about 0.8 degrees centigrade. I once could do the conversion into Fahrenheit, but I'm afraid uh, it's just about two degrees Fahrenheit, I think, but I uh, can no longer do that on the fly very well. Um, the other thing then that we will come back to is that uh, this rise in temperature occurs by no means in a steady way. Uh, we have this rise in temperature over the 100 years or so, but it's interrupted by fluctuations. We have have the ups and downs and ups and downs the whole time, and that's a crucial part of the climate system that, that I will come back to, these fluctuations. And then the more the topic of the talk in the last uh, 15 years or so, it appears as if this warming trend has stopped. Well, actually, it has slowed down. It hasn't entirely stopped. Uh, temperature hasn't. They rose through the 80s and 90s. And then the temperature appears to have reached a certain plateau at a very high level. But nevertheless, the warming isn't continuing at the same rate that it had before. And this is what we call the warming hiatus or the pause or the, the break in the warming or those last 10 to 15 years. And the funny thing, the curious thing, is that even though, as you could tell from the record before, there have been many of these hiatus periods amid the general warming before, but this one has sparked a fantastic debate, an enormous debate, uh, and I will come to some of the issues uh, in, the, in the course of the lecture, uh, what, what has been assumed or discussed. So it is something that we as a climate research community, this hiatus is something we need to take seriously and we have to, to understand it and we have to, to communicate the issues about it. To get 
one of the issues out of the way. It is sometimes claimed that the hiatus in the surface temperature is an indication that global warming is over or does not happen. Uh, no, not at all. If you look at other central indicators of global climate, they show global warming that is continuing. For example, that the Arctic sea ice continues to melt, which it has been doing since uh, at least the late 1970s. The ocean keeps taking up heat and has done that in the, during the hiatus period as well. Uh, there's no break in the uptake and we'll come back in much more detail to the ocean uptake of heat. And sea level continues to rise uh, also through the hiatus period. So we can look at other prominent and central indicators of uh, global climate and they tell us uh, the climate change keeps going. It has not stopped. But this particular indicator of global climate, the global average surface temperature, is rising at a much lower rate now. So that is something we, we want to understand. Um, the, one of the central statements of the fifth assessment report by the IPCC uh, came out in 2013, the working group. One part of it uh, is that most of the warming since 1950 was caused by humans. There's more technical language used there, but that's basically what it boils down to. So we made a statement from 1950 onward. Uh, this is, we, we made this statement uh, because that's where the database, the observation is just so much better than in the period before. Uh, so basically we're making no strong or no state, clear statements about the course of the climate change before that, but we are sure that since 1950 most of the observed warming was caused by humans. And a legitimate good question is, how do we know that? Why are we so sure about this attribution of the warming to anthropogenic origins? There are quite a number of reasons that support this statement. And what I want to present here is what I believe is the most fundamental from a physics perspective. Why we believe, why we are so sure that most of the climate change is anthropogenic. And for that, we have to get a little bit into basic physics, which is energy is conserved. It's not created, does not vanish. And why is that so important for what we do here? OK. Um, why do we have anthropogenic climate change? Physically, what we're doing is we change the composition of the atmosphere, the chemical composition of the atmosphere, by increasing the concentrations of so-called greenhouse gases, in particular carbon dioxide, uh, methane, nitrous oxide. And that change in composition of the atmosphere creates what we say call in physical terms radiative forcing. And radiative forcing is the amount of energy that cannot leave the planet because the greenhouse gases have increased in concentration. So you can think of the greenhouse gases as putting an extra blanket around your body, which prevents some of the energy from leaving and, uh, and, and thereby warms you more. That's the effect that the in enhanced greenhouse gases are. And we express that as a radiative forcing, as an amount of energy which does not leave the Earth, and thereby we can express it as something, something some extra energy that, that is going down from the top of the atmosphere towards the surface. Now what matters for the radiative forcing is not only the greenhouse gas concentrations, but what also matters is aerosol, uh, air pollution when it's uh, anthropogenic, but volcanic aerosol, which is spewed up in the, into the stratosphere. Solar variability contributes to, to, to radiative forcing, the sun shines every 11 years or so, a bit more strongly, a bit less strongly. So all these uh, drivers, changing composition of the atmosphere from the greenhouse gases, aerosol, solar variability, they contribute to the radiative forcing so that compared to a, a sort of to a hypothetical unperturbed situation, there is some extra radiation which in the net is sent from the, from the top of the atmosphere downward. Or just to repeat that again, that 
is not leaving the earth. It stays behind. So we have this radiative forcing. What does that do? Uh, it leads to an increase in the, in the surface temperature. And I'm, I'm looking here only at the global averages. So the radiative forcing leads to, a, to, a, to a, uh, an increase. I call it delta, a delta T in the, in the surface temperature. Now, if the Earth gets warmer, a warmer body radiates more energy outward. So a warmer Earth. Uh, radiates some extra radiation to space, and we write that as proportional to the amount of surface warming. It's a simplifying assumption. It's not a bad assumption, but it has some, uh, there's some discussion that need to be around it. It's in, in, and this proportionality, linking that increase in temperature and global mean surface temperature to the amount of extra radiation, is an abs absolutely crucial quantity in climate research, and I will explain in a second why this is such an important quantity. Uh, we call it the climate feedback parameter. It tells us if we have a certain amount of warming at the surface, how much extra radiation uh, is leaving the Earth and going to space. And what you can see from the, uh, the arrows, remember, we started with the radiative forcing. That's at the, the root cause of everything, the radiative forcing. The Earth warms a bit at the surface, and there is some extra energy leaving. So this extra outgoing radiation counteracts the radiative forcing. But as you can see, for the lengths of the arrows are sort of drawn reasonably to scale. There's not quite as much extra going out than is coming in from the radiative forcing. So there is a net that remains. And that is the energy imbalance. So this here, this green arrow, is the difference between the radiative forcing going downward and the extra radiation going out. But the blue arrow isn't quite as long as the radiative forcing. So there's some net effect of energy being sent downward and energy that stays in the climate system. And energy conser conservation tells us we've got to find that energy. That amount of energy that, from the imbalance here, stays on Earth. Now, hypothetically, we have a certain radiative forcing. We assume, as a thought experiment, it's constant. And we wait for a very, very, very long time, which could be many millennia, or certainly many centuries, probably around 5,000 years, if we had time to wait for so long. Eventually the Earth will have moved up enough at the surface that the outgoing radiation is just the same but opposite to the radiative forcing. So the, the radiative forcing is equal to this outer, uh, extra outgoing radiation. There is no more imbalance in the system. It has come to a new equilibrium, and one of the central climate, or one of the central questions we want to ask, or we ask in climate research is, what is that equilibrium temperature rise? And in particular, we're asking that question for the hypothetical case. Imagine we double the CO2 concentration on Earth, wait for a very long time, how much warmer will it get? And this is what, what's called the climate sensitivity, telling us really how the Earth would respond to, to, a, to a perturbation. And as you can tell here, uh, for, for a certain... Uh, for a certain radiative forcing. If you want to know what the equilibrium warming is, we have to divide the radiative forcing by the climate feedback parameter. And this is why it is so important. If you want to know how much warmer it gets for a CO2 doubling, for example, we have to divide by alpha. And so that means if we have a large alpha, a large climate feedback parameter, we get a relatively small equilibrium warming if we have a small climate feedback parameter, we get a very large equilibrium warming. And the current stage in climate research is that this equilibrium warming is uncertain to within 50%. We still think that the range of warming is for a doubling of CO2 is somewhere between 1.5 and 4.5 and degrees centigrade which in some ways is a bit of an embarrassment for, for our science because that very same range was quoted by the very first report 
on possible consequences of CO2 increase in the atmosphere, the report put together by Ju Charney here from MIT in 1979, and it's the same range. They quoted one and a half to four and a half degrees, and the IPC now quotes one and a half to four and a half degrees. What we can say, and it may sound a bit flippant, but uh, there's a serious core to it. Yeah, we are confused, but we are confused at a much more sophisticated level now than we were in the past. We understand this range much, much better than, pardon me, Johnny and colleagues did. But still, we haven't been able to narrow down uh, that uncertainty. So, but, so it's still one of the core questions having to do with this alpha. And uh, so in, in one of the important questions, but one of the core uncertainties in, the, in, in, the, in, the, um, in, in climate science. Now I said, so energy is staying behind in the climate system from the imbalance. And I, I promised we find it, we know where it is. And where do we find it? We find it in the ocean. So what, what, what we've been doing, we the uh, climate research community, uh, has been looking for the changes in the energy content, for changes in the heat content. And that is shown here uh, for, the, uh, for the various contributions of the climate system. Uh, atmosphere is the one that you can't see because it's so tiny, it's deep down here. So the warming of the atmosphere in ter terms of energy content is totally negligible. Land, well, at least you can see it. Ice, ice melt, there's a tiny bit. Practically everything, over 90%, actually 93% of the energy that stayed behind is in the ocean because the ocean warms. To warm the ocean up by just a little bit uh, is, it requires an enormous amount of energy because water has such a high heat capacity. Um, it, but it also means that finding that energy that was kept behind on Earth is in that respect really a question to physical oceanography measuring the, the increased temperature in the ocean. So we find that, we find this extra energy and we can even make this finding of the extra energy quantitative. This here is the same curve that I showed you before, but just in a, in a different, uh, plotted somewhat differently. And this is, uh, this is something new that we could do in the fifth assessment report. So it's the same curve. This is the amount of extra energy we find in the climate system by diagnosing ocean warming. And then we can take this amount of energy that we find and uh, Add to that the extra energy that left the Earth because the Earth got warmer and radiated more energy out of space. We can do that, and we've done that here. Uh, we added that, uh, so we get this, the orange curve is the or the ochre curve is a sum of the energy we find because the ocean warmed plus the energy that has left in the meantime, and we sum it all up. Alpha is uncertain. So we have different estimates of how much energy left the Earth and therefore what the sum is of what stayed behind and what has left in the meantime. And this uncertainty is indicated here by the spread of these curves for various climate feedback parameters. But then what we can do, and that, that has only been possible in the latest assessment report by the IPC, it wasn't possible before to do that. We can now say, right, According to the radiative forcing and to the history of the radiative forcing, what has been the extra energy supplied to the Earth from the radiative forcing? And of course, since energy has to be conserved, what we're aiming at, what has to be the case, is that the accumulation of the radiative forcing has to be equal to how much left is stayed behind on Earth, plus the amount of energy that has in the meantime left the climate system. So, the accumulation of the radiative forcing, the black line, should be equal to the sum of the blue plus whatever has left in the meantime. The shaded area is a, admittedly quite large uncertainty range of the radiative forcing. It's a hard quantity to diagnose and to, to define. And we see that within the uncertainty limits, we can we find the energy that should be, should be there. We, we have the energy that was 
kept on Earth through the radiative forcing in black. We find energy in the ocean, the increased heat content. We can infer what has left in the meantime. And taken all together, things are consistent with each other. That's a major new accomplishment uh, by research in the last five to eight years that energy is conserved and we find it. And I should also say, well, this delta F, the radiative forcing, we know is largely anthropogenic. So the root cause of the energy budget here is anthropogenic, and we find the energy in the system. And this, to me, is the most fundamental, the most basic manifestation of anthropogenic climate change. Anthropogenic changes of the atmospheric composition led to radiative forcing. The radiative forcing led to energy being kept back on Earth, and we find that energy. That's it. Energy conservation. And now the last part of my lecture, we'll get into this issue of the climate variability and the, the warming hiatus. I indicated that briefly the hiatus, but uh, for the last 10 to 15 years, one thing I did not say, and one thing that probably gave rise to some of the heated debate more than any other aspect of the hiatus is shown here. Uh, so what we have in, in red, is, it's the observed global average surface temperature, now here shown from 1950 onward, 1951. And also in the colors, individual model simulations from the latest generation for the, from the state of the art, uh, the current state of the art global couple climate models, so the best simulation tools we have for climate. Um, and what we see is that Roughly, and also on black is the average over all the individual model runs that, that are shown here. And what we see is that roughly the models trace the evolution of the global average surface temperature since around 1950. In particular, we see like this is the Pinatubo eruption where we had a, a, a cooling and, and the models capture that. But in the, during the hiatus period, the last 15 years or so, we have this plateau in the observed temperatures, but the models, with very few exceptions, kept increasing or showing increasing temperatures during the hiatus period. And so what some people took that to mean, they would look at this and say, well, I always told you so. Models overestimate warming. Models are not to be trusted, and the last 15 years are now proof positive that uh, that the models run too hot and they cannot be trusted. Which is a serious criticism and one uh, which we, as a certain climate science, we either have to, to we have, certainly have to investigate it, confirm it, disprove it, depending what the outcome is. Let me do that in a few steps. And uh, starting by making this notion that the models show a larger warming trend than observed, making that quantitative. And that's what we did here. Um, what we're showing is the observed trend over the period 1998 to 2012. It's about 0.04 degrees per decade. And shown here is just how frequently the model simulations show us a warming trend of a certain size. So we're simply counting. We're, we're classifying models and we're counting. We have 114 individual simulations with about 36 different models. So we're using all the simulations we can lay our hands on. And so we count and we see that most of the models sort of show warming of a bit under 0.2 degrees per decade, uh, warming trend, but some go as high as 0.4 degrees per decade. Observed were during that period 0.04 degrees per decade. When you count, when you really look at the numbers, we find that for this particular 15-year period, 111 out of 114 simulations show a larger warming trend than observed. Right, that's um, a pretty clear statement, three out of more than 100. If you did a typical statistical significance test, which often we like to do at the 5% level, you would say, well, this is less than 5%, so you would conclude there is a statistically significant difference between the simulated and the observed warming trends. Right, sounds quite plausible, but let's now 
look at another 15-year period, the one just before, the one from 94 through 98, uh, same game. In red, the observed warming trend, which there was around 0.25 degrees per decade. And we show the models again, how often does a trend of a certain magnitude show up in the, in the, among the simulations. And what we now see is that almost, or not quite as extreme as here, but most of the models, about 85% of the models, show a warming trend which is less than what was observed. So I pick one 15-year period, and I would be forgiven for believing the models are way too conservative in simulating the warming. They should have warmed a lot more. And I look to pick another 15-year period, and um, I would be forgiven for saying, gee, the models are running too hot. So what is going on? I look at one 15-year period, I look at another 15-year period. How is it possible that, that these two 15-year periods give me so, paint so different pictures? Um, I had to go back to one of the most famous quotes in science. Uh, mache die Dinge so einfach wie möglich, aber nicht einfacher. I have the advantage in quoted in German. <laughs> well, what, what would be the problem here of making things too simple? It would be too simple to believe that what we observe in warming, the amount of warming, was just determined by the radiative forcing and the sensitivity, the climate feedback parameter. There's more than that. It would also be way too simple to think that short-term considerations, this case in climate 15 years short term, would tell us much about the sensitivity of the climate system. And why is that so? It's simply because climate is chaotic in the technical, in the physical, mathematical sense, discovered here, of course, by Ed Lorenz. Weather is chaotic, we know that. Climate is some average of weather. I won't get into exactly which average, but some average of weather. So climate is also chaotic. And that means you can have climate fluctuations which just happen. They have no particular cause, no discernible cause. For example, we know that the globally average surface temperature for no apparent reason can vary by plus or minus 0.2 degrees centigrade. It just happens. For example, an El Nino happens and the year after it tends to be warmer than usual. Why the El Nino happens in that particular year, there's no reason for it. Or, as I learned, you had a particularly Gruesome and harsh winter just happens. Has no, no discernible cause. And so, and what we know is that these spontaneous variations are the more important the shorter the time scales are that I look at. They also are the more important the smaller the spatial region is that I look at. They are, in that sense, they are least important on the global average, but they still matter by those 0.2 degrees centigrade or so. So we have to consider these spontaneous variations. They are a crucial part of doing uh, climate science. But, uh, I mean, the, the technical terms you call them, it's internal climate variability. I, I find the term spontaneous climate variability uh, sort of uh, a bit more evocative, so I like to use that term. But the thing is, and it is something that weather forecasters have known for a long, long time, and in the climate community, we're just now sort of waking up to the challenges that the presence of this spontaneous variability really puts a whole new dimension to comparing observations and simulations of climate variability and change. And, um, Something that I, I would say we as a community have probably not been so good at in the past as we should have been. Uh, and well, it's the to make things as simple as possible. So these, this spontaneous variability made things complicated. And for a long time it seemed as if in communicating to the public, we'd rather do without this type of 
complication. But there is a price that we're paying by, by having, having thought this way. So we have to communicate that. Now let me, let me show the special challenge that arises by through spontaneous climate variability that arises for this juxtaposition of observations and simulations by an example we all know. And again, the people who do weather forecasting, they know all that, but uh, so please bear with me. Let's use a toy observation, a pseudo observation. Uh, this is an observation of two dice and we throw a two. Let's assume that's my observation. With, from the real system, and now I use a model and I try to reproduce this result. Well, I didn't. Take another model, failed again. Yet another model, I failed and I failed and I failed, and here's a modeling center. They have three different, no, four different models. They still fail. So something is not right with all these dice, with all these pairs of dice I have on the right-hand side because... Ah, one manages to get this, but all the others fail to get the right score. Now, of course, you say, oh, now, don't be silly. Um, this is an extreme event. It's a minimum number we could ever see. So we expect that 35 of 36 simulations would show a larger number than my observations show me because this is an extreme event, so don't expect you can just easily reproduce that particular throw of the dice. And then I would say, yeah, you're perfectly right. I have to take that into account. This is an extreme event. But what if the surface warming hiatus also was an extreme event? I might even expect to find only to, to be up above the observed trend in 35 out of 36 simulations. Now, this is a bit of a fortuitous coincidence, I have to admit. One out of 36 is pretty much the same as three out of 114. So the odds are actually quite similar. But the, the more important point is that there's just no point in looking at a single realization at a single instance of a chaotic process, of a chaotic series, compare it to what the simulations tell me and believe I can draw any robust conclusions from this single instance of a test. It makes no sense. It would be as meaningful as throwing a two here and wondering why my other dyes do not reproduce the result. What I have to do is repeat my observations. I have to go through that many times, and I have to repeat the comparison against the simulations as often as I possibly can. And this is something that has not, or had not, until recently, not really been done in any systematic way with the global warming hiatus. And this is what, therefore, a colleague and dear friend of mine, Piers Foster, and I recently published that we said, right, if we want to compare the Global temperature trends over periods of 15 years, when we compare simulations and observations, we have to do that for the entire record that we have, for the entire period, we have to do that as many times as possible. And that's what we did here. So let me walk you through this rather uh, complicated looking plot. It's, it's a generalization of the histograms I showed before. So we have a start year here. So for every start year we look, we compute the 15-year trend. So from 1900 through 1914, that's the first 15-year trend. Then from 1901 till 1916 and so on, uh, 1915 and so on. And the circles show us the observed trend for that particular start year. And we see, well, it started here with some cooling and then it went up to 0.2 degrees per decade. Then it went down again, up and uh, went up and down in a Eventually, I mean, more, more, more trends are positive than negative, but uh, it, th there's quite some fluctuation in, in, in the observed trend. And here at the end, that's a 1998 through 2012 trend. It, uh, it's down to 0.04 degrees per decade. And then we count 
again, the 114 simulations, and, and count how often do the simulations show a trend of a certain magnitude, but now also as a function of start year. And where the shading is, is heavier, the darker colors show us where more models show a trend of a certain magnitude for that particular start year. And we did that for the entire 20th century. And the comparison I'd shown before was for the start year 98 and the start year 84. That was this one here, where the observations lay at the upper end of the, of the simulations, and here the observations lie at the lower end of the simulations. And if we then do this comparison throughout the century, we can also cut it off, it really, the picture remains the same, namely that, well, in some years the observations lie at the upper end of the ensemble of the simulation, sometimes at the lower end, sometimes in the middle, but there's no preferred pattern, there's no preferred position that the observations take relative to the ensemble of simulations. We, one can make that more quantitative, but at the end of the day, our conclusions was that any position is possible. This one is quite, this one is extreme because it's at the lower end, but not in any egregious way different from other times like here or here where again the observations lay at the lower end or here where the observations lay very, very close to the upper end of the simulation. So you, you might just expect any of these positions, which is a very, very strong indicator that the position of the observations vis-a-vis -vis the simulation is largely determined by, called here quasi-random effects, because of course chaos is not random, but it's as good as random in terms of the effects and predictability. And Again, the models show no systematic bias compared to the observations if we look at, at, at all the trends. So that was one part. But there's another part, and in this getting a, a bit subtle, and that is I'm throwing together 36 different models we have, which have different simulated physics, um, and, but I'm, I'm treating them all on an equal footing by showing them all as part of one single large ensemble. So it is equivalent to a, to a tacit assumption we're making that this, the difference here between the simulation and the model spread arises just from the spontaneous variability and not from the different physics, the deterministic physics, like how strongly are they forced, how strong is the feedback parameter, how much heat is going into the ocean. And uh, so this, uh, this assumption is not a priori a good one, that I can just throw everything together in one single large ensemble. And so what, therefore, the next step we took was we asked the question of, if we look at the at the ensemble spread from, the, from this ensemble of simulations, we wanted to ask, where does it come from? How much of the difference between different simulations arises because, for example, the models have different sensitivities to a radiative forcing? Or on how much of the spread arises just randomly from internal variability, from spontaneous variability? Now for that, we have to do a little bit of, of theory, but it comes back to what I said before. It comes back to energy conservation, to the energy balance. And so what, what theory suggests, and it goes back to something uh, Jonathan Gregory and Piers Foster did uh, some seven years ago, that imagine you have an increasing trend in, in radiative forcing, say an increasing concentration of carbon dioxide. I said that the surface would warm. That was a picture I showed you earlier. Um, but I stressed in, in that earlier sketch I showed that if the surface warms, you have some extra radiation out of space. What I did not mention there is if the surface warms, you have also some extra heat transfer to the ocean interior from the surface layer in the ocean exterior. And so the two contributions, the extra radiation to space and the extra transfer of energy to the ocean interior, they formally show up in a very, very similar way 
And at the end of the day, if the dust has settled, what you can show that it's a plausible assumption for the, for the response to the radiative forcing on, say, the 10 to 20 year time scale is that the warming rate is just proportional to the change in the radiative forcing divided by those two parameters where alpha is the climate feedback parameter that I introduced before and kappa is the efficiency of the ocean heat uptake. Two more comments here. Both alpha and kappa, they had been diagnosed as model properties before, before we did this. They vary by a factor of three, both of them. So very, very large difference in either climate feedback and ocean heat uptake efficiency. And remember that the alpha is what is so important for the, for the climate sensitivity, the, uh, because you have to take the radiative forcing and divide by the alpha. So alpha is really the, the, the quantity that people uh, sort of uh, care about. And the reason why we focused on this piece of theory is that we said, okay, theory suggests a regression model. What should the observed, or what should, sorry, what should the simulated temperature trends depend on? And physics suggests three parameters, three predictors, the trend in radiative forcing, climate feedback parameter, and the ocean heat uptake efficiency. And if there is an effect, for especially from alpha, from the sensitivity, from the climate feedback parameter, if there is an effect, we should see it because alpha varies by a factor of three. The smallest alpha we have is 0.6 watts per, per meter square per Kelvin. The largest is 1.8. So if alpha has an effect on, on the spread of simulated trends, this regression analysis should make that visible. And we also say, so we have physics-based three predictors and we interpret whatever the regression model cannot explain as a contribution from, from internal variability. And this is a result we're getting. Um, let me walk you through it and start with the middle. This is the result from the regression. So we ask how much of the spread that we see in the trends, again, as a function of start here, comes from those deterministic factors that the radiative forcing is different among the models, the feedback parameter is different among the models, the ocean heat uptake efficiency is different among the models. And this is a residual. And we see that the residual is three times as large, I think two and a half times as large as typically the explanation that comes from different deterministic physics. And this says that the difference between individual model simulations is dominated by the internal variability and not by differences in the deterministic physics. And if a different, different model simulations differ mainly because of internal variability, by implication it also means that the difference between the observed realization and any model simulation is also dominated by internal variability. And we've shown that here, we've taken in red, uh, sorry, in black, now the, uh, the observed trends, again, as a function of start year. The red is the ensemble average of the models, the, and the shading is this, uh, this distribution here added to the, uh, to the ensemble average. But most crucially, what we've done is we've taken the width of this distribution from internal variability and added that as an uncertainty to the, to the observations. Because whenever we want to, the, the observations have a, a, an amount of internal variability in them, which is a priori unknown. But if you want to investigate whether a model has the, sort of the long-term right behavior, the right long-term behavior compared to the observations, the internal variability is a noise. It's like an error source or like, like some uncertainty that, that we try uh, to get out of the system. And so what we've done here is show, added the in internal variability as an error margin to the observations. And then what we get is if one looks at this comparison carefully for almost all start years, the entire ensemble of simulations or the deterministic part lies within the uncertainty range of the observations. 
It's not quite true at the very, very end. There, is, there are some simulations which are outside the uncertainty range of the observations thus defined. So certainly some of the models, we would argue, have a deterministic error in them here and during the hiatus period. So there's some, some deterministic factor coming into play, but the dominant part for the 15-year trends is played by the internal variability and within the uncertainty arising from internal variability, there's just on the large nothing wrong with the models in their simulations throughout the entire 20th century. We don't want to get into more detail on this, just going back to the IPCC report. These are the two histograms I showed you before, comparing the, uh, the observed trend to the, to, to the simulated trend for the two 15-year periods. We also compared the 60-year period, 62-year period since 1951. Same picture, the, he, here are the observations and, and this is, these are the simulations and we see that over the 60-year period, there's a very good agreement between the observations and the simulations. And what that is telling us is that those, if we compare the 15-year trends, because they are so strongly influenced by quasi-random effects, by internal variability, that they really tell us very little about whether the models do things right over the multi-decadal time scale. It would just be misleading to focus on that short time scale. Something that we showed in our paper and which gave rise to some surprised reactions, I was surprised too, uh, is that when we ask right, these are the observations including uncertainty, this is a model ensemble for the long-term trend, why is this much wider spread here in the simulations compared to the observational uncertainty? So we, we, ra we ran the 62-year trend, so the same machinery, the same uh, uh, the regression analysis, and the result that really surprised me is this, that the dominant source of the spread here is a spread in radiative forcing among the models. So even though the models are use as input the same observed composition of the atmosphere, they produce very different histories of radiative forcing, which is a major weakness of the models. And uh, it was a big learning process for me. As a, as a scientist, I never wanted much to do with radiative forcing. It seemed such a complicated business. And so I thought I'd rather deal with simpler things. And so here I came out concluding that the uncertainty in radiative forcing for the long-term trend is the most important uncertainty we have, which is quite a change for me. The second contribution to spread for the long-term trend is internal variability. It's much reduced, but it's still there. It's still tangible, even for 60 years. Even over 60 years, you cannot forget the internal variability. And even for the 62-year trends, the role of climate feedback is very minor. Much smaller than the, the role of internal variability, much smaller than the, um, than the, uh, than, than the spread in the radiative forcing. And it's this statement that I, I was very surprised by that. And I think it has some major implications, or it might have some major implications for our ability to use the observed record to infer alpha from it and hence estimate climate sensitivity based on that. But that's a, that's a major scientific discussion which is right now just unfolding. Um, so, but certainly what we find is that the, 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 the spread in alpha has very little explanatory power for the spread even in 62 year temperature trends in the, in the CME5 ensemble. So we conclude. Um, the simulations of the 15-year temperature trends are largely consistent with what we have observed. And the, every individual simulation of 15-year trends is dominated, or the 15-year trends you can diagnose from the simulations, dominated by internal climate variability and therefore is essentially an unpredictable quasi-random behavior. Um, the spread in climate feedback, even though it 
Climate feedback simulated in the model ensemble varies by a factor of three from 0.6 to, to 1.8 watts per meter square per Kelvin. It leaves no traceable imprint on the simulated trends in surface temperature, which means that those who claim that the models showing a larger trend than observed over the hiatus period, that this is a sign of models systematically overestimating climate sensitivity. There's just no basis for this claim. This claim is unfounded. Alpha leaves no imprint on the model ensemble, or a very small imprint on the model ensemble. I have talked very little about the causes of the observed hiatus, uh, but I should say that it is a it is scientifically an absolutely fascinating event, and the longer I look at it, the more I'm convinced that it is an extreme event, just like throwing a two with two dice is an extreme event. Papers that came out since the IPCC showed, for example, that's uh, Matthew England and colleagues, that we've had a strengthening of the tr Pacific trade winds, which is unprecedented in history, observed history. The stronger trade winds bring more cold water to the surface and therefore lead to cooling of the surface temperature or lowering of the surface temperature. Postdoc and I were just about to finish a, a paper where we show that there has been an extreme uh, winter cooling over Eurasia over the last 15 years, which probably is a result of purely atmosphere, atmosphere internal uh, variability. And of course, we've had an unusual Solar minimum, we've had some extra volcanoes in the late 1990s, so it looks as if all natural influences you can think of that could produce a temporary cooling decided to act simultaneously. And this is why I believe the, the, the surface warming Hades is an extreme event, which would make it completely natural that models have a very, very hard time simulating it correctly and leave alone at the, at the, at the correct time, but why even so few models would, would, would simulate, uh, simulate this hiatus if it is an extreme event. But that also means, and that comes back to the question I posed in the title of this lecture, that uh, yeah, it's absolutely fascinating for a climate scientist to understand the hiatus. But if you're not in climate science and just want to know what does the hiatus tell me about long-term climate change and what climate change should I expect for the future, assuming emissions keep rising, then the answer is the role is tiny, non-existent. The hiatus is largely irrelevant for long-term climate change. The long-term climate change continues, as we see from the continued sea level rise and ocean heat uptake. And so from that perspective, the hiatus is just a huge distraction, but scientifically an incredibly fascinating one. And with this, I thank you for your attention. Well, Joachim can uh, take questions now. Because we are recording this, if you don't mind and want to go over to one of the uh, microphones on either side, that would be the best way so that your question is then heard on the video recording. Uh, and while people are lining up there, let me ask a question, Joachim, myself. What role do, do the initial values, particularly for the ocean, play in all of these model simulations? Are they part of the residual that you calculate, that you and yeah. peers uh, calculate? It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, from my individual perspective, a bit of a sad story. So what, what Ron is referring to is, I, I mentioned that the internal variability is spontaneous, and I mentioned the word unpredictable. It's true, unpredictable for these simulations that were started in 1850 and ran throughout the 20th century, 21st century, 19th, 20th, 21st century. But you could imagine, just as weather is predictable, if you start the weather forecast from the right state, climate is in principle predictable if you start climate from the right state. And that is something we're trying. Actually, we have a 
major national program in Germany that I can coordinate on that. And one of the hopes was that by starting climate in the right state, I could simulate something like the hiatus because it's already in, in the state. Say, the, in the ideal case, the climate state of 1997 would have it in it built in that the hiatus would come, so to speak. Why I say this is a bit of a sad story is that none of the efforts that try to predict climate over up to 10 years or so from the observed state have been successful, I would say, in a credible simulation of the hiatus. Some models claim some success for the onset, but no model has been able to simulate the onset and then the coming out of a hiatus. So I'm, I'm afraid we have no answer. There should have been an answer. Would have been great. And if you had asked me six, seven years ago when we started this national program, I said, we do it because I think we can predict the something like the Hades that had emerged. But I was overly optimistic. We just can't do it yet. Uh, questions? Yeah, please come to the microphone down there. Thank you. I uh, announce your name. Uh, I know who you are, but <laughs> Uh, Adam Slosser from the Center for Global Change Science and the Joint Program in the Science and Policy of Global Change. Um, Ron raised an interesting question, and I guess this is more of a follow-up question, is even though the models aren't able to reproduce or retro-forecast the onset of the hiatus, you do have in the CMIP archive the historical simulations, and you have shown that some of the models, just because of the random fluctuations in climate, do produce epochs where the warming slows down. Has there been any diagnosis to show that those simulated epochs in some way reproduce what the natural system or what the observations produce? Do you, do you get the same recipe of ingredients in the climate system to produce that hiatus that seems to indicate what's happened over the past 15 years? Yeah, not, 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 in every, not in every respect. I mean, what people have done, um, say, Reto Knutti and Huber um, to, and also James Risby and colleagues, that they have sort of artificially shifted El Nino period sort of back and forth to line up. And they found much better agreement between simulations and the observations if they do that. So, so it's clear that, that, that uh, <coughs> El Nino can influence, and whether you have an El Nino in a particular time can influence uh, uh, the onset or the, or the appearance of a, of a hiatus. Um, I am, the, the, the other contribution from the Eurasian winter cooling, it's m much less clear. I mean, we've, we've done simulations and people have speculated that it might, or that Eurasian winter cooling might come from from the Arctic sea ice loss, which somewhat paradoxically would lead to, to, that very, to those very cool <coughs> Siberian winters. What we find is that uh, the, the effect, it, it nudges, nudges the system a bit towards producing such a thing, but not, it's, it's not a major determinant, um, the, the sea ice loss. And I'm unaware of people having put these two things together, sort of in a, sim, in a single simulation. And even less so, the influence of the prolonged solar minimum and those volcanoes from the late 1990s. None of the two effects is in the CMU5 archive. So in that respect, the answer is no, we don't have simulations which put, put all these four contributing factors in. Uh, plus, I should say there is some speculation that there is more of an influence, some, some Atlantic sucking up of feet and some from the Southern Ocean. So, and then finally, the statement has to be, no, no one has been able to put everything together and, and then evaluate in any, in any rigorous way that the probability of having a hiatus like this. This has not happened yet. Additional questions? I can't believe this group of <laughs> tough old scientists, you know, doesn't have a serious question to, <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm Kurt Sternlaw, I'm Executive Director of the uh, uh, Environmental Solutions Initiative at MIT. And I was wondering, um, 
I hope this isn't an ignorant question, but in looking at the, the globally average temperature graph, it seemed that there was a, a pronounced hiatus and or cooling 1950 to the mid-70s, 79. Um, I understand you to be saying that, that the ocean temperature data suggests through the more recent hiatus that, that the uh, um, global warming has continued because the heat's there in the oceans. Could you speak to that earlier period and also whether the, the ocean temperature data is robust enough to you know, actually indicate that the warming was continuing unabated during that period. Yeah, uh, w when we when we put the box together for the for the fifth assessment report on on the haters, where there was some discussion on whether to use that period you mentioned from from say the mid forties till mid seventies, uh, where where there was a global cooling, we should also discuss that because well, the dialectic principle in science uh, you you look at two different manifestations, you usually understand much better what is going on. I vetoed that proposal because the database for that period is so poor. There's virtually nothing in the ocean we have to, to diagnose ocean heat content changes. And for the atmospheric observations, as I understand it, the, the explanations for that cooling range from, it's an effect of the air pollution in the northern hemisphere, to a quasi-random change in the uh, Atlantic circulation, to there is a major contribution just by the change in observing system after the end of World War II, and much of that is an artifact. At that stage, I said, no, 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 we're not getting into that. <laughs> so we left that period out. But it's, it, it, it's again, it's a fascinating topic. I think, I believe, uh, I totally agree. It's, it's a really important topic. It would be really important to understand whether those two hiatus periods work the same way or whether they work differently. But it's much, much tougher to get to the bottom of this previous one. Doesn't mean it's not possible, but it's much harder. And so, since the, especially in the IPC report that has, has to rely on published research, there's just nothing we could do about it. Uh, I, I think it's really important to do that and to, to, to understand it. And I also believe, in principle, we can learn a lot about the most recent hiatus from the earlier one, but it's going to be very hard because of the lack, relative lack of observations. Yeah, John. Uh, John Marshall from Earth and Planetary Sciences. You've, Jochen, you've focused on the global average surface temperature and how that's changing. But of course, there are there are many interesting regional patterns, interhemispheric patterns, uh, uh, Arctic versus Antarctic. Uh, and to what extent do you think those are also giving us some hints as to uh, mechanisms and whether anthropogenic activities are are at work? Oh, oh I believe it's crucial and um, to look at to look at the spatially resolved observation, also what the simulations give us, because otherwise we, I mean, this, otherwise you can't get to the heart of the, um, of the, of, of the mechanisms. Uh, in a way, what, what I've showed here, and what we did, or did with Pierce in that, in that paper, we pushed the global average perspective pretty much to its limits, I believe, but in everything more we want to know, we have to look at it in a spatially resolved way, and it's very important. I mean, there's some claims that uh, the hiatus is entirely driven by, by, the, the, by the tropical Pacific, that it comes entirely from the straight wind strengthening and the eastern tropical Pacific can do it all. And I think that's wrong. It has a major part, but the tropical Pacific cannot explain why Eurasia cools. And, and that's an example, I think, of what you, what you uh, refer to, that you have to look at the spatially and laboratory resolved phenomena in order to get to get to the next step, to get to the next level, I, I totally agree that this really has to be the next step to get a so the the temporal footprint, get the spatial footprint of the hiatus. If we do not do that, we can't, we cannot understand how it functions. Um, my name is Sarah Simon. I'm a civil engineering graduate from a long time ago, before they even called it environmental, in course one, but I was curious about whether and how much the heat uh, storage capacity of the oceans, which, is, which are even of the surface, three quarters of the world, uh, is perhaps offsetting and making these, these climate change predictions difficult. Uh, along that line, how much of the surface temperature readings are we getting from the ocean regions as opposed to the land regions? And it, 
again, is it possible that just the heat capacity of the oceans, which is certainly the volume as, as the atmosphere and, and much more heat um, conserving, uh, whether, how much you think that might be affecting our, our simulations? I'm, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but if I assume I do understand it, the, the answer is yes, the, the heat uptake by the, the ocean is a cre crucial component. What, what, what the most immediate, immediate effect is, is to slow down, the, slow down the warming we would have. If you imagine a planet with no oceans, maybe just covered either by dry land or a swamp elsewhere, uh, and you switched on the radiative forcing, you will get the equilibrium response within very few years. And it is a fact that the ocean, with its large heat capacity, you have to, you have to warm this entire big, big heat capacity, so it takes much longer. So the ocean slows down the, the response to the radiative forcing. Uh, there are also some more subtle effects that the ocean introduces some extra time scales that probably what we are getting is uh, a relatively quick effect after the switch on of the, uh, of the radiative forcing, which is maybe one half of the final response. And then the ocean, and, 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 and that is because that the, the ocean has to, the surface has to feed all that heat deeper down, and it takes a very, very long time. So by and large, the, the effect is one of a, of, a mooted, uh, of a muted immediate response, and you have to wait for a very long time. The question of the observations, yes, uh, it's, a, it's a tough one. It's much harder to observe the ocean than it's to do observations on land. Some things are a bit more robust on the ocean uh, than, than on land. So, so by and large, uh, we have uncertainties, but we are fairly confident that the, that the coverage is good enough so that uh, within acceptable uh, uncertainty bounds, we have a good measure of the global average temperature. On the surface? At the surface, yes. Yeah. Uh, so John Riley, uh, Joint Program Science Policy for Global Change. So. Uh, you started out your talk by saying this climate feedback parameter is really critical, and I guess you ended by saying we don't know what it is, and 61 years of data were not enough. Uh, I guess there, you might need some more information, but can you infer anything about how long it will take before we can narrow that uh, uncertainty? <laughs> well, let me, let me indicate sort of at least two of the, 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 the ways in which the, the current thinking is going. One is that the estimates of, of climate century of, of this parameter alpha from the current observational record, one of the major impediments to getting it nailed down better is our uncertainty in the, in the historical radiative forcing. It's not, not so uncertain, not only just in the, in the models, but also our best estimate of the radiative forcing. And there's a major debate still, for example, especially the role of the tropospheric aerosol and the interaction with clouds. So now possibly improved scientific understanding would enable us to, die, to, to use the historical record better and therefore get a better estimate of alpha. So I, I think that's, that's one thing we certainly need to do. And there is some other discussion that uh, seems there. There's uh, uh, Kyle Lammer uh, has had a paper on that, and, and others showing that the the real climate system is very imperfectly characterized by a constant in time alpha. So you have different patterns of surface warming depending on where they are, maybe because the atmosphere is sort of transparent or opaque to long wave radiation. These different patterns lead to different efficiencies of radiating uh, uh, to space. So that there may be a problem in the uh, sort of in just looking for a single alpha, but of course, if we want to characterize the sensitivity, we have to home in on a single par uh, parameter. But if that is time dependent, what do we do? How do we deal with it? Also conceptually, I guess the question is now, this is a wild guess, possibly we are biasing alpha high through what we're doing, the way we're treating it, and this may, I may be wrong, we may not be doing that. So people are thinking about that. Uh, so, but uh, I, I'm afraid I have no more firm answer. I mean, I was, 
when I looked at the, at the result we got, at the influence of alpha on the spread, and I really did a lot of searching to the point that I looked at all the individual numbers because I just, I thought my plotting routines were, had just gone amok there because I thought this, this can't be. But I found no error in that. So um, I, I, think, I think it is a difficult question. And, and, and in terms of being able to predict better or project better what, what's in there for the future, it's a very, very unsatisfactory uh, state of affairs. If we say 60 years are not enough to, to get a good estimate of alpha, totally agree. But I'm, I'm afraid right now I can't, can't give a better answer. So we're living with it for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I'm Bob McClatchy. I'm sort of retired. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, the, the question that I have probably doesn't have to do with this hiatus, but it has to do with the comparison of temperatures in the first place. And I'd like to know your perspective. When we talk about ground temperatures, our surface temperatures, are we talking about the temperature of the surface, that is the solid surface or the liquid surface of the Earth, or are we talking about the temperature of some layer of atmosphere near the surface of the Earth, and if so, are the, uh, are the thicknesses of those layers the same in all of these models and in all of the observations? Yeah, now what, we, what we usually mean when we say surface temperature is a two-meter temperature, two meter above ground in the, over land, and the sea surface temperature over the ocean. Over the ocean, there is no difference really between the two. Uh, but this is standardized uh, that uh, looking at, at the two meters uh, standardized across the model. So uh, I think we are comparing apples to apples. What I cannot tell, because this is not at all my field of specialty, is what, what, especially over land, what temperature difference you would get if you compared the real ground temperature to the two meter temperature that I just don't know. But my point is from a radiator forcing point of view, that surface temperature is what's really, or the surface condition is really what's important. Okay, the statement uh, comment was that what matters for the radiator forcing, it's what the surface does is important. Well. Yes, I know, of course, the surface radiates, but then much of that is absorbed in the lower layers of the atmosphere and then re-emitted up, up and down. And so I think if the temperature difference is relatively small, I don't think it makes a crucial difference. Uh, but, but in terms of the, the technical detail, I have to, have to defer to others. Uh, I just cannot say for sure. Yes. Uh, David PC University of Washington. <laughs> do you think we're at the point of diminishing returns of what our community can do for informing policy on climate change? <laughs> you better have the right answer. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, not at all. Uh, although I can believe that uh, that some of the advice we we, we can give. Uh, needs to be given differently. It's a, it's a, I'd like to, to quote a, a colleague of mine from Germany, a political scientist, Oliver Gieden. And he's made some pretty clever remarks and said that there's a danger that, that as climate scientists we tell the politicians what they want to hear. And uh, a particular point is when it comes to the, uh, to the possibility of still limiting uh, global average warm to below two degrees centigrade. Uh, and uh, so if someone comes and says, well, from my analysis of the physics and my analysis of the policy process, or the political process, sorry, I ca just cannot see how this should work. I'm very unpopular with policymakers and politicians. And what Oliver is suggesting we just have to stick that out and accept this being unpopular. And I think if we, if we follow, if we heed that advice that we have to stick to the, the scientific rigor and communicate our assessment, even if the result of the assessment is not liked, I, I think there's still a lot that we have to offer. But it 
it would distance us somewhat more as, as a whole, maybe from where we have been in the past. I, I guess I agree with what you're saying, but I would actually put it in perspective that we kind of knew the answer then 15 years ago. The, the answer the, to? The answer to keeping, uh, you know, if two degrees warming is the target, um, it's not a lot new in the last 10 or 15 years in terms of a reality check that politicians need. <coughs> Unless there's something catastrophic that's going to happen, uh, you know, like, you know, a world pandemic or something. Yep. Um, I'm Jessica Mink, and I was a student at MIT a long time ago and took Ron's atmospheric chemistry course, but that was like over 40 years ago. <laughs> Anyway, my question is, how do the models do for the other warmings and coolings that are going on besides the atmosphere? Is there, I mean, we see that the continued change in seawater temperature is happening. Do the models work with that well? Um, and are there any other effects that the models are modeling, especially well over time, even though this one thing isn't working? Yeah, what, what we said in the, in the evaluation chapter for, for the most crucial elements, I would say, is so the long-term warming, I think the, the formulation we use, we have very high confidence that models simulate that, that long-term warming. And the thing is, it's not just the, 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 the result, but also the radiative forcing matches what we think the radiative forcing change was. So the models seem to be do, doing the right thing for the right reason if we look at them over the 50, 60 year period. Models also, by and large, as an ensemble, they show a sensible amount of energy uptake, change in ocean heat content, again, over the last 40, 50 years. I mean, some models lie above in the heat uptake. I think more lie above than below the observations. But they, I would say they do quite a credible job in, in this heat uptake uh, taken together. So in some of the really important things, uh, they, they, they simulate uh, the climate change realistically. There's one other thing that we looked at, and that is the overall level of variability for the global average temperature, but also for the northern hemisphere average temperature. The northern hemisphere average, because from paleo uh, data, we, we can look at variability out of time scales of around 200 years, with a period of 200 years. And and we find that, again, as an ensemble, the models do a very credible job there. Some have higher variability than observed, some have lower variability than observed. But by and large, they, they straddle the observed variability uh, in a reasonable way. So uh, I, I would say we, we find a lot of climate indicators, uh, that, that some of them, that, those that are really central for what we're looking at here, like the ones I mentioned, are absolutely crucial for the diagnosis of, of the, the, the anthropogenic part of the warming, I would say, yeah, the climate models, they do a very good job on, on very many of the important things. Now, there, there's a huge litany of things that, that models do wrong, and we, no one knows that better than <laughs> someone who uses, develops and uses climate models. But there are also, it's, it, when, when, when asked to remember, there are some things that models are pretty good at doing, and it's some of the really central ones. Yeah, John, go ahead. I had another question that was following up from some of uh, David Batista's and John Riley's questions. And that as a community, how can we, you know, improve the models and, and uh, put more constraints on these and lessen the uncertainties? So what I observe is that, you know, you have 20 or 30 modeling groups around the world that kind of get involved in, in, in IPCC and make these model projections. And, and they're all kind of underfunded and, you know, struggling away. They're running on, on computers that are not large enough to, to do the job. And uh, one wonders whether if we actually resourced two or three groups at a, at a high level, whether that would actually make more sense. And I think Kendall, as a physicist, would say, you know, if you take a model and increase the resolution, you get a different answer. There's something, there's something wrong. So at what point, if we just put computational resources to bear on the problem, you know, given that the future of the planet is, is at <coughs> stake here, surely we ought to be able to, to get to the point where we can just resolve the key physical processes and, 
reduce the uncertainties in these in these in these parameters. I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, uh, very very complex. Uh, I think at least three quite fundamental <laughs> issues. Let me see if I, if I remember them all. Um, let me start by by this thing with the with the subcritical efforts. I totally agree. There, there's I actually see little point, and and I could easily believe that there are too many models, a couple of time models around. And particularly if I see what sometimes happens is that uh, groups get together, they get money for five years, they take off the shelf components, the ocean from here, the atmosphere from here, from there, the land surface from here, and sea ice, and just put it all together and say we have a new coupled model and this is our model. Uh, it happens. Uh, happens more frequently. The yeah, it goes into the into the semi and and the uh, these are not sustainable usually these efforts and the models tend not to be very good uh, and and it shows and uh, so developing a model is very hard work and tends to be the you tend to see that those groups produce the best work with the model and also the best models that developed the model either from scratch or took it from somewhere and changed it so much that it became their own. Uh, so there, there's, there's no substitute for that type of experience. In the end, decades long experience that goes into, into developing and, and further maintaining a model. We, this question of what, what's the right number of models, we, we addressed that in, in Europe some three years ago. We, we wrote a foresight document uh, from an organization called ENIS, European Network for First System Modeling. Um, the conclusion we came to was that we, we couldn't really tell what the right number of physically distinct models was, except that we said we need to maintain a certain diversity because, well, you know, uh, I mean, for many things, there's just no right answer that we would know. And so it's important to try different ideas, um, most prominent like convection in the atmosphere and cloud, cloud formation. There are just different ideas around. And we cannot tell which idea is the best. And so the only choice we have is to try in a very serious way some of these ideas and try them parallel. But what we also said is, and that's a technical part, one that is often not very popular but still important, much of the work that goes into the development and use of a model has little to do with the science, but just purely technical thing, how to run things effectively on a, on a, on a supercomputer, or how to get results out, how to get the results written out in an efficient way so it doesn't slow the whole thing down, that the simulation comes to a grinding halt. What we conclude in this foresight process that, yes, we have to maintain the, the um, diversity uh, of, of the models, but, but we would like to reduce the dispersion that comes from the technical side, that we try to use as many sort of off-the-shelf technical components as possible and focus in the diversity, in the scientific diversity, on the things that matter scientifically. And so I think you can improve the efficiency of the process enormously by sharing standard software components, like how to do input-output effectively and efficiently on, on a massively parallel computer. If someone has found a good way of doing that, there's no need in reproducing that. You just use that solution that, that someone has done. So I think we can gain there. And then the, the last point, this question of the, the biggest computer and, and sort of shouldn't we Shouldn't we invest more? And I'm, I'm constantly torn here on that point. I mean, Tim Palmer recently published this opinion piece in Nature, essentially saying we ought to, to establish one climate uh, modeling center which has at its disposal the biggest computer in the world, really, which, which we've never been able to have. We never had in climate science the biggest machine available uh, entirely to, to climate research. I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I, I sympathize a lot with Tim, and, and, and it needs to be developed further. Um, but given the current lack of clear knowledge of what the best direction is, I'm, I'm, I, 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 wouldn't, I couldn't wholeheartedly support and say, this is the best thing. Let us, let us create one climate modeling center with the biggest computer in the world. And, uh, the one single model. I think one center is dangerous, but I mean three or four. Might, three or four, be, but yeah. possibly. And then we, we, we will discuss it. Tim, Tim has invited a few people to, to a workshop, and we will we'll hash it out, and uh, hopefully, and I'm... Um,
I, and I said, I'm, I'm going back and forth. I'm not sure where they were there. I mean, in, in 2008, we had the, the Climate Modeling Summit in Reading. Um, at that time, I was very much on the, in favor of having a sort of this one single center, certainly for Europe, but I'm, I'm less certain of it now. And so uh, it, it's a difficult question. There's one other thing which goes counter to Tim, but I, I would have to discuss it ideally with him present so he can respond. The typical climate configuration, the dedicated to climate simulations, lags behind the biggest machine on Earth by about five years. It's a factor, an order of magnitude below, and you, you gain that in five years. And, and the typical climate computer costs around 40 million euros every six years. The bigger machine costs 200 million euros every six years. So you're buying five years, and you're buying it once, but the price is a five-fold increase every time. That's a big commitment. And so the question is, do you believe that what you get with that 10 times bigger computer, those factor, those five years you're buying yourself. But, but aren't we recommending that we completely reorganize the whole energy structure of the planet, you know, on the basis of these, uh, uh, I mean, this is chicken feed in terms of the uh, yes, amount yes, of money that's involved. Uh, in yes, energies. it is. Yes, it is. But you still... All you gain is five years. You gain them once. Now, I'm, I've had, ever since I moved back to Germany, I've been involved in the effort of getting the stable funding for the renewal of our climate computer. And I've spent more weeks of my life than I care to think about, about that. And I can tell you that in terms of the the real funder getting 35 million out of him or her is anything but child's play and chicken feed. So if I were to approach them with a request for 200 million, I wouldn't pass a laugh test. So uh, it's, I, even though I mean this, this argument is absolute true, isn't this a really important problem? And oughtn't we throw the, all the resources at it that we have is in principle accepted, but in particular when it comes to computing and competing demands for the money, it's suddenly becoming terribly, terribly difficult. And in this case, I can I really speak of experience in, in that business. Okay, uh, this seems like a good time to uh, wrap up and to Thank you, Ockham, for what I found to be an incredibly brilliant talk. Thank you. <laughs> there is a reception now on the ninth floor of the Green Building.